Welcome back. Last week, we started the discussion about the ABCs, the um, antecedents, behaviors, and we focused specifically on the consequences of behavior. Um, and as we promised, uh, this week, we're going to talk about antecedents. But you know, the reason that we need to talk about antecedents is because, as we said last week, there is much more to parenting. There's much more to managing a child's behavior than just choosing a, a consequence, right. just thinking about the consequence. There's lots of other things that we can do. Right. And yet, most of the books, I mean, if you go into any bookstore, you go into any Google search, you go to Amazon, thousands of books and vice columns are about consequences. Right. What's, what's the best, how can I reward them? How can I punish? And why punishment is necessary. There's all these books about, remember John Rosamond, he used to have that, he was big on punishment, you know, yeah. real, real severe, severe not, not physically severe, but sort of long-term punishments that really, really hurt. Um, and there's also this, <laughs> I always appreciate the mental gymnastics that it takes to justify spanking. You know, you frequently you have people who say, no, we have to spank children. It's okay to spank children. And then they go through all these, this mental calculus, this me these mental gymnastics about, well, it, you, you, can, you can't use your hand, you have to use an object. But if you use an object, it can't be this object. And you can't hit this hard and you can't leave marks. Right. You can only do it under the, there's all these things, these gymnastics that you go through to justify spanking. When spanking is not justifiable, Okay. Right. If you just do away with it and stop trying to make it okay, stop trying to justify it. Right. But that's what most of these books do. There are manuals about how to spank children and how to punish and how to reward. And um, that's what most of us are fed. If you go into most teacher training programs, they learn a very limited repertoire of rewards and punishments. Right. And in, even when people come to see us um, and, and seek support from a professional, mm -hmm. one of their first questions is they need um, more effective punishments is basically- I what need a, I don't I need a more, how many times, time. how many times do we hear, I, I need a more effective way of punishing my child. You right. know, what I'm doing is not working. I need better punishments, you know? And, and so, and that's what people ask for because that's what we're taught, okay? Right. And most of this stuff, most of that consequences, is about controlling, um, getting kids under control and keeping them under control, okay? And so, as we said in our, the previous podcast, we don't want consequences just that just create discomfort or inflict pain on children. We want children to learn something from the consequences. Right, uh, absolutely. You know. We've worked with a lot of parents and, and children, and, and over all the years that we've worked with them, you know, parents never say, you know, I want my child to fear me, you know, yeah. or I, I want my, my child to work hard because he knows if he works hard, he's going to get something from it. He's going to get a reward, you know? He's going to get a toy or a treat. Mm -hmm. Right. People say things like, you know, I want my child to value the importance of working hard. Um, mm. I want my child to, I, I want to have a loving relationship with my child, right. you know, but, but we apply or we identify these consequences, these punishments. Right. Um, but it, so when we do so, we're saying exactly the opposite. Right. And I want to, I want to underscore that. And you're absolutely right. Go and talk to a hundred parents, go talk to five parents and say, what do you, what do you want to accomplish with your child? You're never going to hear um, I want my child to rely on me as long as possible. I hope my child is still living with me when he's 25 or 30 years old. Right. I, you don't hear that. I want my child to be afraid of me. I want my child to absolutely fear me. Um, I, what do parents say? I want my child to be independent. Right. I want my child to be self-sufficient. I want my child to have intrinsic motivation rather than me having to constantly be rewarding him for doing right. the things he's supposed to do absolutely okay? that's and, and it happens over and over and over across the, the decades we hear the same thing and yet our discipline systems are built and used to accomplish just the opposite of what we want to accomplish with our kids right and, and it's a very western if not very much so a u.s 
um, idea that we that we have to punish children in order to get them to do what we want them to do. Mm -hmm. um, that it's a that it's the parents or the authority figures' responsibility to apply a punishment to keep kids in order, as though kids are these savages that if we didn't we weren't punishing them, they would be running all over the place. <laughs> and, um, you know. Right. we would not be able to control them or something. Yeah, I mean, we see it all the time. Um, you know, a kid starts to cry in a grocery store and you get these glances and glares from other people who, and the, and the assumption is, is you don't, don't punish your children. You're, you, don't, you don't have your children under control. You haven't done your parental responsibility. You haven't punished your children enough that, that uh, and that's why they act the way they do, okay? Right. But as soon as you start thinking about punishing your children, your parenting starts to go off the rails. And that, that's going to lead you down into a dry, you're gonna drill a dry well. It's not gonna produce anything. When you start thinking that you have to punish your children to make them turn out a certain way, you're, you're headed in the wrong direction, okay? And it, and it occurred to me the other day that we fear, we kind of fear children. We, there was a time when we feared um, when, when our country had slaves, there was a constant fear of a slave rebellion. Mm -hmm. um, there's a constant fear. The Romans had it, you know, when, with their slaves. The Romans had it with their legions. Um, there was a constant fear that the legion would rebel. Um, there was a time when we feared having women, uh, women physicians or women CEOs, you know. There, and there was a time when we feared people with special needs you know, when we hid them away in institutions. And so throughout our history, we've had this fear of others. And now it's almost like we have a fear of children. Like if we don't, if we don't control them from birth on, if we don't control school children from the moment they enter the building, that they're somehow going to go haywire and burn the place down and kill all the teachers or something there's this innate fear of children that I don't think is justified. Right. And, and we have this idea that we have to keep kids under control um, to, because of that fear of them just taking over. I don't, I don't know what the fear is taking over yes. or becoming <laughs> uh, uncontrollable. Um, but, but we don't recognize that that is all external control. We're not, we're not teaching the kid to control themselves. We're teaching them that, if this person is in, in, in their presence, if this person is around, if this person who can apply this punishment is there, then you're under control. But if that person's not there, and again, mm -hmm. the research is so consistent with this, right. if the person that applies the punishment isn't there, the mm -hmm. child has no reason to follow those rules. They, the child has no, there's no intrinsic motivation for the child to do what they're supposed to do mm -hmm. because they're not learning the right behavior, they're learning to avoid a punishment from a particular person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear, when, when we talk about this, I hear many parents' voices and, and they'll say, and, and they mean, it, there's a, well, if I don't, um, if I don't do this, if I don't um, punish my child, um, then they're going to be out of control, they're going to be rude, they're going to be disobedient, disrespectful. And, um, and they know that I'll pop them. They know that they're, that they're gonna get it if they do those sorts of things. And I'm saying, yes, that's fine if you're there right. to, to, to make sure that they're doing it. What happens if you're not there? Right. And, and well, they're gonna, they're gonna know that they're gonna get it. Well, what if you never find out? Right. Now a child, as long as nobody finds out that the child is doing things, right. then the child, can do those things in one place and not do them when the parents are around, when the punisher is around, okay? Right. That's really not what you want. Right. You want a child who has some sense that you never do this, whether I'm here or not, you never do it. Right. And so you don't wanna rely on external control. The other thing is, is what if they go into a classroom and they don't like their teacher? Right. And they don't respect the teacher. Mm -hmm. then is it okay to do these things? Right. Well, and I think that... Um, you know, do you, do okay. you have to raise a child who's... No, go ahead. Uh, what, what, and I, I think 
or I wonder, and, and this was just coming to me just now, um, as you were talking about that, is I, I wonder how this might be related to a lot of the a lot of the things that we're seeing from parents now, where um, because, because I, I think at some level parents feel bad when they have to apply too many punishments to their kid. You know, parents, even parents who promote spanking, they mm -hmm. feel bad that they have to if they have to spank their kid right. too many times. And so, like you said, you know, if the parent's not there, then the, then who knows what happened? Who you know? Then are you still going to spank the child because somebody else said? So, <laughs> I hope it's not too convoluted, but like I'm thinking about those situations because we hear them all the time, where a child does something that they're not supposed to do at school. Um, the child doesn't tell the parent. Um, right. but, but the teacher will write about it in the agenda or in, in a note home or something. And when the, the, the parent confronts the child with it and the child says, I didn't do that. I don't know what they're talking about. It wasn't me. We now have this phenomenon where the parents are going against the teacher. Right. And I, and I wonder if it's because parents know, I, I don't want to keep punishing my kid, but I wasn't there. So I can't, I don't know that I can, you know, I can be confident or right. whatever. But I, we have that tendency to, to just say, um, you know, we apply the punishment, we apply the consequence, um, but you're right. If we're not there, if that person isn't there, the punisher isn't there, we don't know what really happened. And so now you're getting into a situation where are you punishing a real behavior or are you punishing the child just because it gets, again, very complicated very quickly if, we're, if that's the only thing that we're relying on. Right. Yeah. Because and, and so what you don't want, whether you're spanking or taking phones or whatever you're doing, you don't want you don't want um, to get into this external control to, that you're always you are always controlling the child's behavior. Because, again, if you ask parents what they want, they want children who can control their own behavior, who will behave whether I want my children to behave, whether I'm present or not. That was the goal. OK. Yeah. Do we always get it? No, but that's the goal that we search for. So if you're constantly relying on external control, you're never going to achieve, you're never going to get the internal control. Right. It's not going to magically happen because the child turns 15 or 16 or 18 or 25. Right. Um, you, you, have to, you have to teach internal control. Right. And I, and I think that to begin that process, we have to start with realizing that we don't have to be afraid of our kids. Mm -hmm. you know, unless we are doing something that we shouldn't be doing anyways, <laughs> that being unnecessarily cruel or unnecessarily punitive or, you know, when spanking becomes abuse, that those types of things, you know, that's when somebody calls DCF, right? That's when we start to get in trouble. Um, but, you know, otherwise, we don't have to be afraid of, of our kids and some consequence to how we're raising our kids. Right. Exactly. Yeah, because unless you're being unreasonable, but it's not just physical abuse. It's if kids think if if your children think you're being unnecessarily cruel mm -hmm. or you're being unreasonable or you're being unfair, all those things can create problems. OK, right. so you do have to be careful, but you don't have to be afraid because um, unless you're, you're being unreasonable and unfair and um, then you're going to get pushed back. And that's when kids start saying, that's when kids now threaten their parents, well, I'll call DCF. You know, I'm, many kids will do that. They'll so I'll call DCF. Um, the second thing is when you fight, when you attack people, and we talked about that last week, is, is that you can't, you have to stop punishing people. But because when you attack people, people will fight back. They, they will tend to push back. You know, you can poke and poke and poke your children, um, but eventually they're going to fight back. There, there's going to be some reaction. Okay. Um, so the point is, you don't have to. You don't have to attack them. You don't have to attack them personally. You don't have to attack the person. Um, we can just we can rely on teaching them what we want rather than punishing them for what we don't want. Okay. Yeah. And I think that part of that begins with recognizing that you know, kids are going to be kids, kids are going to be rowdy, they're going to break rules, they're going to be defiant, they're going to be loud and messy and all those things that we don't always want them to be. Right. And we just have to teach them when it's appropriate to be those things and when it's not appropriate to be those things. That's right. And not let things get out of hand. 
Yeah. You know, but they're going to be all those things. They're right. going to they're going to they're going to be all those things, and we just have to constantly be moving them in another direction, rather than looking for quick solutions to stop behaviors as they occur. Right. Um, the other thing to remember, and we haven't talked about this uh, over the past couple of weeks, some kids are easy. Mm -hmm. They're they're just some. When I see those bumper stickers say my child's an honor student at such and such a school, you know, and I think there are just some kids who are easy to raise different. We all have a different temperament and some kids have very easy temperaments. They sleep well, they eat what we ask them to eat. They go to bed when we ask them to go to bed and other kids are very difficult. And so we also have to keep in mind that while some children are easy, other children are difficult and we don't always know why they're difficult. Right. We just know that they push back, they resist more, they, they fight with us more, they, they, uh, they're, they're more defiant, they're more willful. Uh, we use all those words to describe these children. But when it comes to these more difficult children, consequences are even less effective with them. Right. You know, the tendency is, well, this is a strong-willed child, I have to be stronger than the child. I have to have even more Right. consequences and they have to be more severe draconian consequences but the irony is that the most difficult kids respond less to consequences right. than the easy kids right right yeah it's um it's it's almost counterintuitive for most parents but um but it, but it's true the more the more challenging the child oftentimes the less effective your consequences are and it, and it gets us back to the point that instead of focusing on what we need to do to punish or reward a child, we need to focus mm -hmm. better on teaching them. Right. Um, right. And, you know, and of course, that always leads us back to, you know, okay, so what are we teaching them? Right. Um, you right. know, are, what, what are, what exactly do we want our kids to know? And, and we kind of alluded to one important thing just a moment ago is, you know, when is it appropriate to be loud and when is it appropriate not to be inappropriate right. to be loud? When are we, when is it okay to be silly and goofy? And when is it, time that we're supposed to be more serious and, and more reserved. Um, those are the, some of the things that we have to teach our kids because they're not gonna know that intuitively necessarily. Right, that's right. And so when we say, to, we're, what we've been saying the last two weeks is we have to use consequences differently, but we also have to recognize that consequences are just one part of the toolbox. Right. There's all this other stuff that we should be doing that occurs before the behavior. Mm -hmm. Everything that we should be doing prior to the behavior so that we can prevent these undesirable behaviors from occurring to begin with, okay? And so when, when we begin to, when parents begin to shift the emphasis from give me the best consequences to how should I do this? Right. Um, the first thing we ask them to do is create the environment Right. That will result in the behaviors that you want. Absolutely. I mean, you can't you can't have a chaotic household and expect your kids to be organized and calm and orderly. If right. the TVs are on and people go to bed when they want, they sleep where they want. I mean, there are kids all over the country. They sleep wherever they they sleep wherever they fell asleep. Might be in a chair, might be on the floor, might be on a sofa. Um, they don't go to bed. They simply fall asleep, maybe when they're done playing a video game or watching TV. Right, well, and, and how many times do parents ex have the expectation that their kids keep their rooms nice and neat and tidy, but yet every other place of the house is disorganized and things are all over the place and right. th there's no yeah. other place where it's n nice and neat and orderly. Right, and you, there are no reliable meal times. Kids sort of graze or they snack or they, you know, they don't eat a dinner and a breakfast and um, so, Sleep is chaotic, uh, eating is chaotic, um, clothes are scattered all over the house, they're not where they should be. Right. You can't have a chaotic household and expect your kids to be clean and calm and organized, okay? Right. Second, if you want your kids to, so if you, want, if you want your kids to be calm and organized, then you have to create a calm and organized environment. That's, that's an antecedent. That's what we do to avoid the behaviors. That's how you prevent undesirable behaviors. Right. Another thing is if you want kids to clean up their messes, which they should, you have to start at day one. 
Mm-hmm. You know, when I talk to parents whose kids clean up their messes, they say, oh no, she was doing that when she was three. It was something that we just always did, okay? We didn't punish her for not to, but just something we always did. If you made a mess, you, you had to help clean it up, okay? The other thing we ask parents to do is get ready for the first resistance. Right. The first resistance occurs at about two and a half or three. Mm-hmm. And it occurs because there's a large um, increase in new neurons that occurs at about age two and a half. The brain sort of explodes with new neurons. It's the neurons that kids are gonna use when they go to school, Mm -hmm. okay? It's the neurons they're gonna use to learn to ride a bicycle, to kick a soccer ball, to throw a baseball. Um, Those neurons aren't there when they're born. They are produced at about age two and a half. Well, guess what else happens? They start to feel competent. (laughs) I think of that uh, Sesame Street characters. I can do it myself. Okay. And that's what they're saying. Is, I can do it myself. It's not that they're rejecting you. They're just saying, I can do this on my own now. I don't need. So what that no means is, no, I can do it myself. Right. right. And so, but get ready for that. It's going to occur. Right. If your child has an easy temperament, it'll be okay. You'll get through it. If your child has a difficult temperament, it's going to be a little tougher. Right. But you have to anticipate that about age two and a half, things are going to change. Everything will be okay. Don't panic. Um, but but kids want to do things on their own. Okay. Right. And and there are a number of other sort of mile markers that we have Absolutely. to think about as the child's developing. So we have that at two and a half, and then there, there's another one, of course, at five when kids are starting right. kindergarten and they're going to. School. Yeah. How do you how do you know a kid's ready to go to kindergarten? You know, right. what does a kid need to be ready to leave the house and go to kindergarten? Right. There's mile markers at age five. Right, because if, now all of a sudden they have to be able to take direction from someone else. Right. Um, you have to be able to cope with and deal with all the pressures from mm-hmm. all these influences from other kids that are not part of family and everything. Right. Um, another mile marker is at age eight, um, mm-hmm. you know, third grade, because that's when there's a major transition, not just in the way that kids learn, but also, you know, mm-hmm. what we expect as it, as it relates to um, emotional and behavioral regulation. Um, and right. socialization, right. kids need mm-hmm. to have those skills by that time. That's right. That's right. And then uh, that's right. A kid should be able to sort of manage their own life after third grade. They should know what their homework is. They should right. know where their books are. They should know where their clothes are. They should be able to pretty much do that on their own after age, after third grade. Okay. And then you hit puberty. Right. Okay? And there's a whole other set of things that happen. There, the, the two times of life where there are big changes, two and a half, which right. we talked about, and the other time is puberty for the same reason, because at, with the onset of puberty, you get this explosion of new neurons, and those are the neurons you're going to use for high school and college and for having intimate relationships. You didn't have all that stuff when you were seven or eight. Right. You had to hit puberty, then you got the neurons, then you could go on and do high school and college work. Okay? So, but again, not an easy time. Right. And two and a half is not an easy time. And just after puberty is not an easy time. Okay. And all of this leads us into that A part of the ABCs, the antecedents. And, and antecedents are just as important as consequences. Um, but Say that again. Right. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, spend as much time on the A as on the C. Right. You know, everything that we, we learn and everything that you, you mentioned this earlier, everything that we read and all this information is coming about the consequence. But mm-hmm. if, if we spend more time on the antecedent, if we spend more time mm-hmm. focusing on setting the child up for success, right. you know, creating right. a positive environment, um, preventing those, those triggers and those, provoke, that, those provoking things that we do, mm-hmm. The more that we focus on the antecedents, the less we have to worry about consequences. Exactly. <laughs> because, it, because, then, because then the consequence is going to be that naturally occurring consequence. And you don't have to worry about doing anything. Right. You know, one of the things that uh, I always say that one of the best places to learn all this stuff is in the military. Okay. So what is basic training? Basic training is antecedents. Mm-hmm. Okay, you're learning how to do things from day one. We're going to do this and this, and this is our schedule. This is how we do things. This is what you're expected to do. And all that work. Now, if you don't do it, you get a consequence. But all the effort is in setting up the schedule. There's a reason why you get up. Remember that famous talk 
by the Navy SEAL, the commander of the Navy SEALs, make your bed. Right. You, you know, first make your bed. There's a reason why you start by making your bed, okay? Right. And, and, and that's what antecedents are about. It's what right. the military does so well. Right. It, it, antecedents are just setting the table up for success. It's, it's right. all the things, it's mm -hmm. preparing everything for um, what we want, how we want things to go, how we want things, how we want everybody to behave, what we want everybody to do. So, right. you know, everything from setting a schedule to creating habits, you know, all of these things are antecedents because what we're wanting is we're wanting to create sort of some automaticity so that everything around us is devised in such a way that we're going to behave or we're going to respond in the way that we want to respond and behave. That's right. And you don't have to think about it day in, day out. This, you, right. this is the way you do it. You don't make your bed some days. You make your bed every day. Okay. Right. We don't do it on Fridays. We do it every day this way. Right. And that's what the, that's what, that's what we've learned with athletic teams or military units or any organization this is how we do things okay and then you settle into how you do it which allows you then to accomplish whatever mission you're supposed to accomplish but right. you have to set things up to work the way you want them to work right so so you know when we think about antecedents again we think about things like con um schedules mm -hmm. so you know if, if you're if you're waking up at the same time every day if you're going to bed at the same time every day if you're having meals around the same time every day, life becomes predictable. And so now we don't have these battles and fights over, well, no, it's time for bed now because um, we go to bed every night at nine o'clock. Yeah. We're not battling with a kid at 8.30 or nine, uh, or nine o'clock with playing video games. Mm -hmm. well, no, because our schedule, our routine is and always has been at nine o'clock, we're in bed. Right. So All that stuff right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is just how we do things. I remember when I grew up, uh, no, when when people grow up in a church going family, right? Okay, and it's like we go to church every Sunday at ten thirty. Okay, the, the certain families, right? And you do that every Sunday. Okay, if you're Jewish and you celebrate Shabbat on Friday night, every Friday you do this every Friday. Okay. You just get used, the whole family just gets used to it. And, and the kids will say, you know, a friend will say, hey, you want to go do this on Sunday morning? And the kid will just automatically say, I can't, we go to church on Sunday morning. There's no point in asking because we go to church on Sunday morning. That's just our routine, right? So we don't, and, we don't have to deal with a consequence for that. We don't, we don't have to deal with any of those conflicts because mm -hmm. it's our routine. That's right. It's, it's like... Um, going to uh, visiting a grandparent's uh, home okay there are many families who go every sunday or every sunday at noon or every uh, saturday night we go to my grandmother's okay it's just something we do and so you're asked to go out and do something you say no that that's when we go to my grandmother's so i know i can't do it on saturday night that's what we mean about setting up schedules you know this is bedtime this is awake time um it doesn't change every day there, there's an order and a structure in the schedule. Okay. Right. And it's the thing, same thing with things like life habits. Mm -hmm. um, you know, kids eat what they, what they are given to eat, um, what they're allowed to eat. Um, you know, we, there are many kids that we, that we meet who have um, either have never had or have rarely drink soda, for example. Mm -hmm. It's not because they're being punished or it's not because they behave badly when they have a soda. It's because our life habit as our family is that we don't drink soda. Don't drink soda, right? Um, and so, um, our our family is, you know, again, we go to we go to bed at this time, and we wake up at this time every day. Um, that's just what we do. We exercise as a family. Our 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 expectation is that we're going to go outside at least thirty minutes every day and do something. And and you can you can picture what this looks like in a home, if um, parents get home from work. And they make a meal and then they have a meal and then they go out and we all exercise as a family and then we come back in versus no meal and you know parents are sitting in recliners smoking and drinking and watching tv i mean right. it's a completely different environment okay right. no moral judgment but it's just what what is the environment that you want your children to grow up in 
Right, because it's and it's all about setting the example, right? Sure. It, it's the kids are going to do what you do, not not what you say. Right. So if you tell them you need to go outside and exercise, but everybody else in the family are sitting around watching TV, mm-hmm. it's going to be tough to get that kid to go outside and play on on a consistent basis. So when you're doing those good positive life habits and positive behaviors, mm-hmm. your kid is going to do those things too because it's just what we do. Just it's just what we do, and I I can't emphasize enough that I can remember Sunday morning. Some people do um, a lot of people around here do church on Wednesdays. Mm-hmm. In fact, some schools don't even assign homework on Wednesdays because they know the kids and parents are going to be at church. And I didn't go to church on Wednesday nights. And when I was growing up, we went on Sundays and sometimes on Saturdays. But um, Wednesday wasn't a church day where we lived. And but when I came here. That's that became an important day, and there once again there are families, there are kids, very young children in, in elementary school who know not to make any other plans on Wednesday because that's a church night, that's youth group or children's church or whatever, and so it just becomes part of their schedule. Other kids participate in athletics, mm-hmm. and they know that that you can't make plans on a Friday night because you have obligations on a Friday night. You know you're going to be playing, or you have practice. You know some sports practice. You coach soccer for years. Right. And um, you would have practice on Tuesday and Thursday. And right. your kids, your team members knew that this is where you were going to be on Tuesday and Thursday. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and when you have that kind of predictability, that kind of um, routine, and, and you're managing those a- antecedents like that, mm-hmm. you're avoiding predictable problems. Right. You know, what right. we mentioned before about, you know, um, about lying. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if you if your kid wants to play Xbox, we mentioned we mentioned this last week. If your kid wants to play Xbox, mm-hmm. um, avoid the problem of your kid lying by not you know don't ask do you have homework, <laughs> because if you ask do you have homework and the kid is really eager to get on the Xbox, they're going they're, the likelihood is they're going to lie, um, not necessarily because they're wanting to be bad or not necessarily because they don't think you'll ever find out, but because all of my friends are getting on the Xbox right now. I want to get on the Xbox, even if it's for just a little while until you figure, until mom figures out that we do have homework. Um, don't, don't ask that question. Avoid that problem and just say, hey, let's look at your backpack first and make sure that you don't have any homework. Um, and that's right. That's right. Um, you know where the landmines are in your home and in your life, okay? If you know that, you know, many parents say, well, they pick the kids up at daycare and then they want to stop in the grocery store. Right. You're tired from work. Your kids are tired from school. Everybody's irritable. And now you're going into a busy grocery store. And everybody's what do you think hungry. Is happen? And everybody's hungry. So they're what gonna you, what you, they're gonna, yeah. What do you think is gonna happen? So avoid those predictable problems, you know. Right. Um, call ahead and have something delivered so when you get home, there's food on the table. Um, avoid the predictable problems. You know what they are. Just don't look for trouble. You're going to have enough without it. So avoid the predictable stuff. You have to manage your expectations. Right. You know, what What should you expect? And um, what should you expect a five-year-old to be able to do? What, what should you expect a five-year-old to not want to do? Okay. And so you got to know, you have to know what the expectations are. You have to know what age-appropriate behaviors are. And you have to manage your expectations. Don't expect, you know, we have a thing in this country, and we certainly learned it during the pandemic. We learned, we know, we relearned it during the pandemic. I don't think there's any adult who expects, I don't think adults know that there are good days and bad days, that some days I have energy and some days I don't, that some days I'm, my head is clear and I can get stuff done. And other days, it's not so clear, and I don't get as much done. Right. And yet, we expect children to be on every day. Right. We expect them to go to school and be functioning on for every class period for the entire day. Right. Okay. Kids are going to have up their ups and downs just the way we do. Right. And there are going to be days when they're pleasant to be with, and there are going to be days when they're not pleasant. And so parents have to learn how to manage their expectations. You can't expect perfection every day. You'd like to have it, but you're not going to get it. Absolutely. 
Okay, so what should we expect when you say manage your expectations? Well, first of all, you need to know what's normal at each age. Right, and, 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 you know, and what's normal is different as the child develops. You're gonna have changes in what we need to, what we should expect from them. Um, right. What you expect from a two and a half year old is very different than what you expect from an eight year old. Um, right. It's just going to be different and, and you right. have to be aware along the way. Mm -hmm. and, and we talked about the milestones, the mile markers at age five, mm -hmm. because at age five, a child is going to leave home and they're going to go to another place and they're not allowed to say certain words right. and they have to respect whoever the adult is in the room. And they're just going to have an, a whole other set of expectations at age five. Same thing's going to happen at age eight. They're right. going to be expected to be able to take care of themselves. And then you have the interruption of puberty. And puberty is another one of those very difficult transitional times that parents just have to be ready for. It's not easy, but, you, but if you prepare for it, it's gonna, it's gonna make it easier than if it suddenly erupts and you're not ready for it, okay? Then there's another, there's another mile marker at 16. Right. But because at 16, they're gonna be in control of a lethal weapon and you're not gonna be there. Right. They're gonna get into a car Mm -hmm. that could become a lethal weapon for themselves or for anybody else involved. Right. And you're not going to be around to get, so you better get them ready for 16. Absolutely. And then 18. And, and, and then at 18. 18, you want them to be, be able to be completely self-sufficient. They're all out on their own at that point. They should be able to walk out. They should be able to walk out the door and take care of themselves. And many 18 year olds are nowhere close to being independent. Right. But the, but the legal system isn't going to care right. if, you, if you did all that preparation because after the age of 18, from 18 on, they're, they're considered adults in the eyes of the law. They're considered adults. Right. And if they break rules or break laws, then they're going to be treated and punished like an adult. Absolutely. And there's nothing you can do about it. You can't say, well, I didn't finish my child rearing. I didn't, I didn't know. No, it doesn't matter. At 18, somebody else is going to be in control. Absolutely. Okay. So there's much to do. And when we talk about creating circumstances, you have to create circumstances that are calm. You can't leave this to chance. You have to create circumstances that create children who at age 18 are ready to walk out the door. Right. Right. Okay. Um, one of the things we talk about is anticipatory guidance. Mm -hmm. And parents need this. Okay, my child's three, so I have two years to get ready for kindergarten. Right. Okay, my child's seven. If my child can't take care of herself, her clothes and her belongings and her homework, I only have one year to accomplish that right. because the rest of the world is going to expect her to be able to do all that in fourth and fifth grade. Right. Absolutely. Okay. So, And part of the expectations and anticipatory guidance is understanding when you're going to get some resistance, right? Mm -hmm. Understanding what you're going to expect in, as far as pushback from your child. We, right. we are, I mean, we talked about it two and a half and at puberty, you're going to get some of that um, pushback, but right. um, understand that that's a naturally occurring thing that happens. Um, it, it's not about your kid being a bad kid. It's about a normal part of development. That's um, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're going to get resistance, not because the kids disrespect you. Right. You're going to get resistance twice. You're going to get it once at about two and a half or three, and you're going to get it again at puberty. Why? Because at two and a half, kids now have a different brain, and they're able to do things on their own, and they want to do it on their own. They want to do things on their own, or they should want to do things on their own. And so they're going to resist you so that they can do it on their own. That's exactly what's gonna happen again at puberty. Mm -hmm. At puberty, kids can think and do in ways they couldn't do before, and they want their independence to be able to make their own decisions. So you're gonna get some resistance. It's, the resistance is normal. Right. You have to be ready for it, and you have to know why are you getting this resistance? What, what is this child after? And typically the child's after more privileges, more independence, more um, um, self-control, more right. control of their circumstances. They want to be left alone. 
That's all normal stuff. Okay. Right. right. And so you have to get, and then what are you going to do about that resistance? Are you going to crush them? You're going to say, no, you can't have any privileges. No, you have to start letting go because at about the age that puberty occurs, you have to switch from attachment parenting yeah. to detachment parenting. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, your whole parenting shift, your whole parenting emphasis and focus is going to have to shift from attachment to detachment parenting. Right, because puberty is all about, you know, if we think about it biologically, you're becoming an adult. So it's all about, from a, from a again, from a biological perspective, right. it's all about reproduction. And, and, and reproduction is all about independence and, and separating from the family, separating from the, the caregivers to become right. independent, um, self-sufficient, right. reproducing um, member of the, the group. Right. You know, if parents, you know, we, we talked last week about if parents could think about behave, punishing behavior rather than people, if parents could think about puberty just from a biological perspective, forget about everything else, okay? Mm -hmm. Just know that our species at about this time, 11, 12, 13, you know, we go through this change, but puberty is about reproduction. That's the biggest thing that's happening. It's about the ability to reproduce our species, okay? And now keep in mind that to reproduce, you have to leave your home. Right. Think about that, okay? You can't reproduce in your own home. Well, who wants to leave the comfort of home? <laughs> you know, um, most kids don't want to leave until they go through puberty and then they really want to leave because if you're going to find a mate, it has to be somewhere else. Right. And so you have to leave. Well, in order to leave the comfort of home, you have to have a little risk taking. You have to be willing to take risks. Okay. Right. And so what, do what, are what are teenagers known for? They don't want to be at home and they want to take risks. Okay. <laughs> but, that, but look at it biologically. Forget right. about they don't like us. They're rejecting me. No. That's not what this is about. This is this should be happening at their age. Remember, for a very long time, we lived in um, we lived in villages, you know, small clusters of people, and we couldn't intermarry. Mm -hmm. Okay, so because you'd be with a relative, and so you had to leave the village. You had to, not the comfort of a home, but the safety of your village, and you had to go out into the world. And so. Only those who were willing to take risks could would reproduce, and so those are the genes that we ended up with. Right, absolutely, and and, and that's all the more reason to get back to what you were mentioning a moment ago um, that switching from attachment parenting to detachment parenting, because you know all of this that we've talked about today with the antecedents is setting it up so right. that you can your child can detach and go out and be independent when it, when that time comes. Um, if, if you're only relying on consequences, mm -hmm. the child doesn't develop the same level of competence to be independent. And so then they remain, you know, attached and dependent upon you um, as they're moving into adulthood and as they're moving into those years where they should be, you know, venturing out and, and be acting on their own. So that switch from attachment to detachment parenting, when you apply those antecedents the way that we've been talking about, right. that shift is much, much easier than when you just rely on consequences. That's right. That's right. By definition, if the child's behavior is dependent upon consequences, mm -hmm. they're still attached to you. Right. That's right. That's right. And so we want you to have attachment parenting until the child hits puberty. Around middle school, okay. This is when this occurs. Around middle school, um, from there on, you have to start. But you know, people say we have delayed adolescence now. You know that kids right. takes it longer to grow up. Um, and in some ways, yes. But remember that at sixteen, if a kid is, if a, if a child, a youngster, a teenager is going to start driving at sixteen, they better be adult like in most of their behaviors. Right. Okay. So you have much to do. Um, prior to age 16, you have to get that kid ready 
to have adult responsibilities by 16. And by age 18, they better be able to be on, they better be able to function right. without you. Okay. Absolutely. And they better know what the consequences are if they don't, because they're not your consequences anymore. Those are adult consequences. Right. Okay. So there's much to do. Um, even today, when we talk about delayed adolescence, um, there's still much to do to get kids ready to be independent at 18. Absolutely. And we have these little windows of opportunity. You know, you get to age 16 and you say to parents, you only have two years for this kid to be completely independent. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. You have work to do. And, and all of that is, is, again, much easier, much smoother when you focus on antecedents as opposed to consequences. Because That's right. What do you need to do to get your child ready? Not you shouldn't be thinking about what, how can I punish my child for misbehaving? Right. It's the, it has to be what can I do to get my child ready for what's coming? Absolutely. Absolutely. So oh, it was a long, it was a long road to get there. Nobody, parenting is not easy. It's, and it's, it's a not, long haul. Yeah. Not at all. Yeah. But we'll keep, we'll keep talking about these things um, yeah. times and, and, and working to help everybody out uh, as we make some of these transitions. So, right. but that okay. I think, is it for today until that's it, right? Nothing well, else? that's it um where right. are we in the month we're in the middle of the month yeah. um everybody's on vacation except us yep right or it that's seems right. so it seems like everybody's on vacation except for that's us like it. <laughs> okay all right um, enjoy this uh, enjoy the remainder of july absolutely because then school will be starting back so we'll talk oh, about that. oh, that's right so oh now that really that's a good reminder school starts earlier this year yeah we're we're down to about three weeks mm-hmm there's only three weeks of summer left. Right. Summer vacation. It's almost over. Right. So get ready, start preparing. Yeah. Okay. More about the antecedents. So, all yeah. right. That's it for today. Until next time, stay happy, stay healthy, and forget to be afraid. <laughs>